What would you do if you found out your entire world were a work of fiction? Welcome back to Otaku Daikun! I've mentioned Recreators before in a previous Anime Surge video, during which I gave it a legendary recommendation for its gorgeous art, lively animation, compelling cast, and driving score, courtesy of Sawano Hiroyuki. The longer I've had to think about this spectacular anime, the more I've come to view it as one of the best anime ever made. And a huge part of that is the deep, enriching philosophy the anime explores. There's so much to talk about, and simply giving it a quick highlight just isn't enough. So here we are, ready to dive into the multiverse that Recreators paints for us. We'll be looking at how the themes presented in the anime relate to us, and how we enjoy works of fiction. Obviously, this is going to be filled with spoilers, so go ahead and watch the anime first if that bothers you. Honestly, I think it's so amusing that spoilers won't really detract from the experience, but to each their own. Before we dive into the anime itself, I want to explore the idea of creation and fiction as we currently view it. If you've been following my videos long enough, you might know how adamant I am about preserving the freedom of expression within fiction, because it allows us to explore a myriad of complex emotions and situations that often aren't appropriate for real life. Through fiction, we can expose ourselves to controversial or difficult ideas in a safe space so we can grow and improve ourselves, expanding our mental horizons. Fiction also enables us to indulge in fantasies that can't or shouldn't be sought after in reality. This is because we make the characters in fiction for our own purposes. When somebody complains about the objectification of a fictional character, I find it odd since, technically, all fictional characters are mere objects, toys for us to manipulate, whether it's a hero, bad guy, comic relief or eye candy, we control the destinies of the characters we create, since they have no autonomy of their own. Whether we choose to pretend these characters are fully realized people is up to us. Sometimes we want to suspend our disbelief and indulge in an escapist story where we ignore the author and imagine a story is occurring organically in the world presented to us. Other times, we simply want an excuse to beat up the bad guys and feel no remorse. For us, Creating and enjoying fiction is a wonderful thing, but part of what makes Recreators great is that it forces us to confront and take responsibility for these ideas. The premise of Recreators is surprisingly simple. It supposes the idea that whenever we create a work of fiction, be it through images, literature, performance, or cinema, the fictional universe we create actually exists parallel to ours. That'd be like saying the world of Middle-earth or Star Wars actually exist in separate universes, realized with as much detail as we've put into them. Thanks to our antagonist, Altair, key characters from these fictional worlds are dragged into our world, where they discover that they're merely the products of their creators. Quite suitably, these characters refer to their creators as gods, as everything they are and everything they've done exist only because they were created to be as such. This realization brings me to the first major philosophical talking point, the illusion of choice. I've seen some religious people out there who willingly admit that they believe they have God to thank for all of their success. Not just their success, they credit every single event in their lives as part of God's great plan for the universe. In essence, their belief is that the complex causality of our universe isn't actually a chain of events following rules of cause and effect, in which everyone's choices interact with each other and the laws of physics, but rather all these occurrences are in fact guided by a divine will. To me, this appears to undermine the value of our decisions, and in more extreme versions of the faith, completely eradicate our own agency. Why? Well, when we make a choice, we do so under the impression that we have options that we could have chosen from otherwise. For every nice thing you could do for someone, you could have been a total douche. We acknowledge that outcomes aren't inevitable. If we fail, we understand there is likely a set of choices we could have made to be successful. Under the religious belief I mentioned, however, either God is making decisions for you that there are no alternatives, or God is ensuring that certain events occur regardless of your choices. 
Either way, it presents the illusion of choice, the illusion that we have control over our own lives. And some people are totally fine believing in that. In Recreators, this isn't just someone's religious beliefs. For the creations, they're discovering that they've never truly had choice because they literally have a creator who made them. The creations can walk right up to their creators and find out why they were created and made to do certain things. Until the very instant they were pulled from their worlds, they had no real choices. But it's important to realize that, while they were blissfully unaware of the creators, their world seemed completely real to them. They certainly felt they had agency. They were written to believe they were influencing their own lives through the choices they made. Imagine being in their shoes. What if someone told you that you were actually just a character in someone's story? I imagine you'd doubt that at first. After all, you certainly feel like you have agency. If you choose to eat cereal for breakfast, you feel like that choice is real because you could have chosen to have oatmeal or any number of things. In much the same way, the creations and recreators are reluctant to realize the full extent of their existential dilemma. For most of them, they get as far as seeing their creators as meddling gods. Rather than worrying about being no more than a puppet, they maintain their care for the world they came from and desire to change that world for the better. They confront their creators and try to have them address the complaints they have for their own world. Celestia Yupitiria, for instance, requests that her writer, Takashi Matsubara, put more subtle detail into his writing to flesh out mundane things like the taste of coffee so that her world is more sensory and vibrant. For most characters, however, the complaints are much more severe. If you created my world, if you created me, then why does that world have so much conflict? Why do the people in it struggle and suffer? While this normally applies to ethics, religious philosophy often deals with a concept called the problem of evil. Supposing there is an omnipotent God, why does said God allow for or even command evil? Usually, this is used to argue that the Christian God isn't as all-loving or universally benevolent as some describe. But the problem of evil is still a dilemma that applies to recreators. In real life, we acknowledge evil as something people choose. And even some theists believe that their God created them with free will, which wouldn't truly be free unless the possibility to be evil existed. In some philosophies, we need evil because without it, we have no good, or that goodness has no meaning. In less monotheistic faiths, gods actually aren't depicted as being inherently good. Just like humans, they have personalities and intentions of their own. The Greek gods, for instance, bestowed blessings or turmoil based on their own whims. You could anger a god and invoke their wrath, for instance. This view of the divine matches up much more closely to the creators in the anime, in that writers often put evil or conflict into their stories for the sake of drama to make a more compelling work of entertainment. As the saying goes, conflict is drama, and at the very core of our standard narrative structure is an event that disturbs the protagonist's life, setting them on a journey to try and resolve that disturbance, facing obstacles along the way. Even in slice-of-life stories, there's usually some sort of conflict that drives the characters, even if it's as mundane as studying for a test or doing homework over the summer despite wanting to go outside and play. That said, being told your life exists for the entertainment of someone else isn't exactly pleasant. This is most severe with the character Blitz Talker, who in his own story, Code Babylon, is forced to shoot his own daughter to put her out of her misery. He refuses to be content with the fact that his daughter is dead because the drama it caused made his story more compelling. He realizes right away that the one to blame for his suffering, for the loss of his child, is none other than his creator, Shunma Suruga, Understandably, he wants her to resurrect his daughter, and if she can't do that, he wants to kill her out of a desire for vengeance. As it turns out, suddenly writing someone's story to be pleasant and devoid of all conflict isn't all that easy, leaving the creations to contemplate their lives more profoundly. They stop trying to fix their worlds, and instead try to come to terms with themselves. The creations who finally accept that their characters and stories yearn to understand the meaning behind them. This is best conveyed by Alistaria February, hero of the dark fantasy, Alistaria of the Scarlet. In her story, she is written to be constantly fighting the forces of evil, often struggling in a losing battle, having to exhaust every ounce of her courage to persevere. At first, she hates her creator, Guy Takarada, for making her world so cruel, dark, and full of chaos. 
She threatens him to save her world, but meets disappointment when his attempts don't work. To resolve her identity crisis, she confronts Guy once more, demanding to know the reason he created her dark world, refusing to simply accept it as a source of entertainment. She wants to confirm that, through her suffering, through the pain of her world, there is a more profound meaning. At his breaking point, Guy finally admits that this is the case, that even entertainment can be rich and meaningful. By creating Alisteria to be a brave, persistent warrior in the face of insurmountable odds, he hopes to inspire and grant courage to his readers. If she can keep fighting the good fight, hopefully readers will resonate with her struggle and face their own problems bravely. This helps Alisteria accept her role. I'd most compare her to my favorite anime character, Artoria Pendragon. She's obviously not real, but if I were to meet her in person, I'd have to explain that even though she suffers greatly as a fallen king of Britain, her journey through the good and the bad in her life make her very special to me in a way that nobody else can. This desire for purpose and meaning, to be part of a work that transcends mere entertainment, is important to the other creations and helps sate their complaints. Meteora, for instance, is able to love herself and her late creator after playing her own video game. She senses the passion her creator put into creating her world, and that is enough for her to embrace it. Celestia, being the hero of her own story, is quick to see how beloved she is to fans, and realizes through her fame how important her story is. She gets to know her two creators, her writer and artist, and is able to understand that they want the best for her. Others are far more lax about learning their identities. Rui Kanoya doesn't think too much of it, finding it cool that he's a creation people enjoy. And Yuya Mirokuji realizes that he's better off not knowing too much about his own story, instead just treating his time in the real world the same as ever, an opportunity to fight strong opponents. Two characters, Mamika and Hikayu, come from worlds that are generally much more pleasant. Mamika is adored as a magical girl in a story with a lighthearted tone, while Hikayu's actually grateful to her creator for also creating the boy she loves in the story. Lastly, there's Magane, who's actually a villain in her own story. She had no reason to protect her original creator to begin with, realizing she's a creation doesn't faze her, and she instead just uses the real world as her own playground, a second chance at life. Among the creations and recreators, we have varying reactions to this existential dilemma. Some don't care. Others seek meaning to their lives while a select few have a loathsome vitriol for their creators. That said, one issue that Recreators doesn't really address for me is how a victim character would feel meeting their creator. Sure, you could explain to a villain or tragically killed hero that their role contributes to the deep meaning or beauty of their stories, but what about those poor, unfortunate NPC types? In Attack on Titan, for instance, there are a lot of civilians and soldiers who we don't really learn much about yet they are brutally murdered by the Titans to establish the story's dark tone, to demonstrate how dangerous the Titans are. If I were that type of character, and I got to meet my own creator, I'd be pretty pissed. Why do I have to be the one to die so someone else can be the hero? Why can't I be the hero? Obviously, when we experience worlds like Attack on Titan, we do so while suspending our disbelief. We don't think of it as the creator playing God, deciding who gets to live and die. Instead, we pretend that there's something special about our heroes, something about their circumstances and behaviors that set them up as the survivors. Obviously, plot holes and overbearing plot armor break that illusion, but in general, we acknowledge that under different circumstances, even the protagonist can meet the same grave fate as those less fortunate. But yeah, from a production standpoint, creators truly do control who lives and who dies. So far, we focused on how the creations feel about this dilemma, but what about the creators themselves? As I mentioned before, we create works of fiction to explore ideas in a safe space because they're not real. We can confront death in a horror film, witnessing brutal murders, without worrying that real people are being killed. In a game, I can realize my fantasies with other characters, without worrying about violating their rights or autonomy. Whether it's realistic, cool, or skimpy, I can dress my characters as I please, which is obviously something that would be inhumane to do to an actual person. I can die in a video game, again and again, subjecting my character to horrific deaths as I try to get past a difficult section, and not worry that my failures are actually killing people. They exist for us, 
But Recreators forces us to confront that notion with its twist that creations actually do exist. Creators tend to be humble, making stories they find fascinating, but things change drastically when they realize they actually are the gods of their created worlds. I liken this dilemma to the film Stranger Than Fiction, which I'm about to spoil. In it, novelist Karen Eiffel discovers that her latest book's protagonist, Harold Crick, is an actual human living in her world. Whatever she writes him to do, he does. And whatever she writes happening to him, inevitably happens to him without question. Of course, as a dramatic finale to her book, Karen intends to have Harold killed in an accident. That is, until Harold, her own character, confronts her and pleads for his life. Suddenly, creating fiction, which should have no ethical constraints, becomes a matter of genuine homicide. Is the supposed meaning or dramatic value of a novel really worth a human life? Karen winds up finishing her book without killing Harold Crick, much to the dismay of her literary peers, who think it detracts from the quality of her story. But can you really blame her? Fictional characters aren't supposed to be real, and thankfully they aren't, but Recreators makes us consider the circumstances in which they are. Obviously, none of the creators know that their creations are real until they meet them, but after the truth is out, the creators have different reactions. For some, it's relatively easy to deal with. Takashi, for instance, is very fond of Celestia and intended on giving her a happy ending anyway. Thankfully, he wrote Celestia to be pretty easygoing, allowing her to accept her predicament without much trouble. Nishio Onishi, Hikayu's creator, adores his own character, never really putting her in danger. While he's a total pervert who enjoys putting her into lewd predicaments, he's lucky that he wrote Hikayu to be willing to indulge in her creator's perversions so long as she gets to be with her lover. Tenkyu Kurokama, on the other hand, is much less fortunate. His creation, Magane, is a serial killer who winds up murdering him for the fun of it. She didn't really have any wishes he could grant her, and she was written as the kind of person who wouldn't revere her own creator. Sometimes being the god of your own world involves taking responsibility for your own creations. Again, creations aren't supposed to be real. If we knew they were, we probably wouldn't make so many monsters or villains. Imagine if H.R. Geiger, designer of the Xenomorph, had to meet his own creation. Perhaps he would have made it a little more cuddly. The most interesting creator in the anime, to me, is Shunma, the mangaka of Code Babylon, because she is clearly the least remorseful about her own creations. While she doesn't prefer to be a murderer, she stands by her creative decisions, even after learning her characters are real. She believes killing off Blitz Talker's daughter, Erina, was the right thing to do for her story. Even though she winds up reviving Erina at the end of the anime, she only does so to gain Blitz's cooperation for the final battle. As they part ways, she mentions that she may very well write more tragedy into her manga, if she feels inclined. Another reluctant creator is Ryo Yatoji, who is forced to reveal a major spoiler of his manga so that his two lead characters, Sho and Yuya, can start working together. They're supposed to be bitter enemies who later discover that they've been set up against each other by the manga's true villain. While he's willing to do it, he complains about having to reveal the truth so soon, preferring to have his two lead characters struggle longer. Admittedly, Recreators stops just short of dealing with any major moral obligations the creators have toward their creations. Everyone kinda just gets off easy, minus Tenkyu. This is because all the creations and creators have to work together in the end to defeat Altair, who is trying to destroy the entire multiverse. This forces everyone to cooperate against her, conveniently dodging the subject. Regardless, the anime gave us tons to consider, so I really don't mind. The last thing I want to address regarding this anime is a reaction to my first point regarding choice and agency. The fascinating thing about this anime's premise is that the moment the creations come to our world, they're essentially liberated from the confines of their worlds. Basically, they are no longer their creator's puppets. While they still have the same abilities and personalities their creators left them with, they begin to experience things that aren't guided by creation. Alisteria becoming friends with Mamika and eventually sacrificing herself in the final battle against Altair might be within her character, but these events are beyond the control of her creator. They are finally her choices. Every creation has the chance to learn about themselves and ultimately head down a path of their choosing. Celestia chooses to blow herself up in order to defeat her partner Karan, 
an outcome her creators never intended. This is because the creations who are brought to the real world are merely instances of themselves. It's easier to say that, rather than pulling them from their worlds, they are practically reborn in our world. While they derive power from the works they originate from, it's not like Celestia choosing to die, for instance, is suddenly going to end the story of Elemental Symphony Vogel Cavalier. At the end of the anime, it's clear that her creators will continue making the light novel, and a new season of her anime is in production. Inversely, even though Magane killed her own creator, she still lingers in our real world, despite no longer being a part of her original world. Some of the characters, like Blitz and Yuya, actually return to their original worlds. But even then, I'd argue that, because they've had a chance to see our world, the worlds they return to must be different from their ongoing mangas. This means that there's not just one single version of a given character. Which makes sense, considering our perception of a fictional character is comprised of our own opinions, the opinions of the community at large, and the various works that character is featured in. This is why Altair is such a cool character. While she was initially designed by Setsuna Shimazaki, she became a popular character among fans who, like Hatsune Miku, all collectively contributed to her character giving her tons of powers and unique traits. While Setsuna certainly wouldn't want Altair to destroy the universe, the fact that Altair has her own agency in our world means that she is able to learn about Setsuna's suicide and deeply sympathize with her. In fact, it seems the only person Altair will truly listen to is Setsuna herself, which makes the climax all the more interesting when Sota brings out a version of Setsuna he created from his memories of her. This isn't the real Setsuna, but a creation that's sincere enough to convince Altair to step down. What Altair is ultimately able to settle for and be happy with is a separate universe where she and Setsuna can be in peace. Admittedly, the multiverse logic gets a bit crazy, perhaps less sensible than it should be, but the interesting ideas that it inspires are well worthwhile. Wow, now I feel content, knowing I've said most things I want to say about this anime. That is, other than I'm pissed we still don't have this show on Blu-ray in the US. I truly hope you've enjoyed my dive into this anime, and I'd absolutely love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like, comment, and subscribe to Otaku Daikun for more anime lists, reviews, discussions, lore videos, live streams, and the Holy Waifu Wars. If you're interested in seeing this channel grow, please consider becoming a patron or donating in a super chat during any of my weekly live streams. Also, feel free to check the description for my social media profiles, including an ever-growing Discord full of fans of anime and the Fate series. Until next time, celebrate your fandom!